Right. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our AGM. Welcome to Keenan Malik, who we're delighted to have with us to talk to you when uh, I've finished boring you. Um, I, I'm delighted to say that the society goes from strength to strength. We are a very active society in all sorts of different ways. Members access what they what they want in ways that suit them uh, from being you know, coming to lots of events or other ways that we offer. And in consequence, because we have a very high into the 90% retention rate each year, we're, we are steadily growing, as uh, I will tell you in a, a bit. That is in no small part uh, a result of the contribution that my friend here, Neil Smith, has made these last 10, 11 years. Neil, uh, at various times, has been secretary, membership secretary, treasurer simultaneously, uh, stood into the bridge, to train two people who didn't make it as as secretary for various reasons, and as Tracy's successor, <laughs> who's, who's doing a great job. Uh, Neil, Neil um, officially steps down today when we uh, we all stand for re-election apart from him, and also um, Anne Cromberg, who's made very significant contribution in developing the role of education trustee, uh, in developing our outreach to different forms of education, um, but doing a terrific job with, with Jaron and uh, with, with Guy and with uh, others to develop our um, awards, in particular the Journalism Award, which is now a joint award uh, with the National Union of Journalists, which of course was Orwell's union. Uh, they, they will both be stepping down at this AGM and I'd like you to show your appreciation to me. It's lovely to see that we have a mix of uh, old friends here and some members who this would be their first AGM. Uh, when, when I uh, took over as chair, uh, effectively at the beginning of 2020, officially at, at this point in the year in 2020, um, we as a set of trustees set ourselves a, a three year strategy, which we formulated during the course of the autumn. And one of the elements of that was the targeting of membership growth. Uh, I'll talk in more detail about that in, in a bit, but uh, very simply, um, we set a target which we thought was ambitious of by the end of 2023, uh, 24 rather, to be at 500 members. So in three years, 500 members, which would have been doubling the membership that we had. In practice, we achieved that in two years. And as we stand today, I wrote to two new members this morning before coming down from Derbyshire, um, we have 534 members. And they're in 29 countries, is that right, Chris? Something like that, yes. Um, well, we have a lot every time scattered across the states from East Coast to West Coast. Uh, Australia has quite a lot, but the, the most countries in Europe we have at least one member now, which is uh, which is good. I think every country, yeah. yeah, apart from the North Pole, yeah. um, <laughs> other polar bears signed off. Um, you will see also when Ziggas goes through the the numbers with you that the stewardship of the society is in very good hands. Uh, 
Uh, I'd just like to talk a little bit about um, strategy preparation for 24-26. Uh, as I said, the average literary society has about 100 members. Clearly, we have a lot more than that, and we're growing. And that puts us, I think, in a sort of crossroads territory where we want each of you to continue to have the same benefit of membership as you enjoy now. We've already hit one buffer, as you know, earlier. We've had to change the way that people apply to come for events because uh, we filled the trip from Marrakesh, which was 20 people in seven minutes. <laughs> in a further 27 minutes, we could have filled it again. Uh, so we now, if, a, if an event's going to be oversubscribed, we, we draw lots for, for, for who, who actually, actually goes. One of, the, one of the strengths of this society, I think, is that we're all volunteers. Every one of us is a volunteer. Uh, we don't have paid staff. Um, so there, there isn't that sort of tension which can exist in some voluntary organizations between paid people and unpaid people and members. Um, and I, I would very much like that we continue to do that. During the last 18 months, two years, uh, and longer in one case, we've had a lot of support from people doing roles to help whoever is the frontline trustee. Um, we have Steve Fulger sat there behind Diony, uh, who's looking after the nuts and bolts and keeping the, the website in good nick and making changes as we ask for them. Uh, and has increased the footfall to the website, which is great. Uh, we have Ian Bloom, who last year was a specialist in, in uh, law that relates to the things that we're involved with, uh, as volunteered to give us support legally. We have general support from uh, David Hallmark, Richard's brother, who's a general practice system retired. Again, if there's something that falls in that patch, we're not spending money, we're taking a bit of advice so that if we do have to take a, a, a page of money, it's, it's dispensed accurately, if you like. Um, a few years ago, Masha said, uh, I'm going to have difficulty combining writing my new book, All World in Russia, and doing the journal. Could I have somebody to help me? And Jason said, yeah, I'll, I'll do that uh, for a couple of issues. Four and a half years later, <laughs> um, having given Sterling service, uh, the Jason's stepping down now, and Brian Rubin, um, would you like to stand up, Brian, so people can see who you are? <laughs> Brian's, Brian's taking over that. One or two issues. The other person that's come in very successfully, I'm not sure what's happened to him because he did plan to be here. So I hope he's not in trouble with the trains or whatever. Um, Alex Dennis uh, has now been membership secretary for what, about three years now. Yeah. Um, and, and, and again, it's doing a very efficient and uh, effective, uh, effective job. Um, Chris, as I've said, has taken over a secretary, but we do need more. We have had Bruno is putting his hand up and threatening to perhaps put his hat in the ring to become education trustee instead of Anne. Those dis dis discussions are continuing. But education is a huge field. And if there are people who have specialist knowledge in primary education, secondary education, any form of tertiary or higher education, uh, we, we would be very interested because 
one of the one of the uh, the key things that uh, Richard and I are particularly conscious of is Anna Domini. Um, and Orwell remains relevant today for all the reasons that you know and love him and why you joined the society. We want the society to continue to be relevant and that requires that we pay a lot of attention to succession planning um, and we encourage more young people to join the society. Um, so that leads into uh, strategy preparation. Uh, this year we will do as we did for the previous one, which Chris will organize uh, a membership survey that will go to every member. Uh, shortly, I will be writing to all our younger members, or, or as many as you can identify accurately, um, offering them the opportunity to join myself and Ben to do a bit of brainstorming about what it is that attracted them to join the society, what, what insights would they have to help us attract more people to join the society, because it's a blooming long time since I was a young bloke. Um, and uh, we have to recognize that things are different for people now. And there is an enormous, enormous competition for people's time and interests. Uh, I don't know any voluntary organization, my wife and I used to be Samaritans. Uh, you, wherever you look, there are organizations that are crying out for, for volunteers and there just aren't enough people to go around. So we, we have to find a way of appealing to these people. We will combine all this input with, with the preparation work that's been going on since January among the trustees and present a strategy document which will be available to every member by the end of the, the final quarter of this year. We've done some thanking, but I think it's important that uh, I recognise I'm in a very enviable position. Um, I have got a wonderful patron who gives selflessly of his time. I think there's only been one event that he's not attended that I've organised since the beginning of the society. And the only reason he didn't attend that was because he was doing a catch-up talk to people in Eastbourne that he'd committed to do so therefore he couldn't come with us on the London and Paris walk last year. He's absolutely indefatigable in his support and he's not just doing it for us, he does it for the foundation and for the All Well Archive as well. He, he doesn't, he's, he's constantly in demand for speaking. And in fact, on the 25th, uh, we had a school in God knows where in the middle of, rural Canada, email us and say, would it be possible for our school children to ask Richard some questions? So they've sent in their questions and uh, Rick will be answering those on Zoom on the 25th. They sent the link, but not the questions. <laughs> no, no, they sent questions earlier. Oh, well, that's the way down. <laughs> I will make sure you get it. What every leader needs is a is a is a critical friend, and you know, I get enthusiastic about things, and sometimes perhaps uh, I'll go over the topic. Need to be calmed down a bit. Um, Neil did a fantastic job of being my critical friend, and I'm delighted to have Chris because he's taken over and it's been an absolutely seamless handover, and I very much appreciate that. Um, in the same way, and you'll see in the, in the clear presentation of the numbers, Sigurds has taken over the, 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 the numbers for our as treasurer. Um, as trustees, we are 
legally accountable to the charity commission, uh, making sure that what you give us is properly looked after. And as you'll see, uh, Sigurd does a great job on that. Uh, I've, I've, I've explained what some of what Anne does. Last March was the 85th anniversary of the publication of The Road to Wigan Pier. And as we did for the 80th, we had a, a weekend in, in Wigan. That, we, that included a number of things, one, one of which was uh, opening a permanent exhibition in the Museum of Wigan Life. The Museum of Wigan Life is the former library where Orwell studied all the uh, statistics on housing, health, and all the rest of it that are incorporated into the road, road to Wigan Pier. Um, and you know, we were delighted to have uh, Lisa Nandy and, and the mayor there for that opening. But for many, the highlight of the weekend was the Friday evening. The, 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 the school's award, on, uh, we started uh, piloting it in two areas with a strong all world connection. Um, South Shields, because of uh, Eileen being born and brought up there, and Wigan for obvious reasons. Uh, and they had borough-wide competitions. The, 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 the school that won St. Mark's Primary School, which is in you know, one of the more uh, disadvantaged areas of, of Wigan, uh, the teacher there did an absolutely superb job. And I think for many of us who, who were there, hearing the children read their written work, show us their drawings, which show a huge connection is really what we wanted between the children's family and family life uh, through Orwell into their surrounding area. So suddenly, Grandpa isn't the old boy fast asleep by the fire. Grandpa's got actually interesting things to talk to us about. Um, and that was reflected in, in the wonderful enthusiasm of those children. Um, we will be going back to the 90th. And for those of us uh, who've been to Wigan, yesterday, uh, Rick and I heard from Alan Gregory, uh, who's uh, done this great job trying to create pathways for people into theatre and music. Uh, he's planning to have a big launch of the fully uh, worked version of what we saw as a, as a, uh, a spoken play uh, to be the highlight of our Wigan 90th weekend. This morning, or a lot of yesterday rather, one of our new members in America wrote to me and said, uh, I'm really enjoying reading my first journal. Um, and Masha has developed that journal. She now has every, every, every uh, distinguished all world scholar around the world now is keen to be on our pages. Uh, and that's a testament to the respect that people have for Masha and the way she developed that journal. It's, it's fantastic. And all of, all of that's been going on while she's been writing this wonderful book. And uh, Masha will be giving uh, George's talk in June. July. July, rather, yeah, and the book will be launched in June. Um, all World and Russia. A lot of the, 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 the reason we've been able to grow has come from two things. One. Neil making it possible for people to join easily online instead of having to print off a PDF and post it in and all of that. But we ask people why they join, and some people join, but they've joined. And it's always lovely when somebody says a member's recommended that I join. But by far and away, the largest reason is people searching online. 
And obviously, it's a lot of all world material out there. Uh, the foundation obviously has a lot of material, but Les does a fantastic job through the, this Twitter feed, through both the public and the private Facebook pages, and the way he curates the content on the uh, website. And that is by far and away the most common reason that, that people join. And last but by no means least, this is going to outlast all of us, um, <laughs> is Ben. Um, for, for, before Ben got established in the role, if we had inquiries from the press or television production company, um, they, they, either, they mostly came to, to Neil, sometimes they came to me directly. Um, but Ben's now established himself. If the press won't uh, comment or want to interact with us in some way, they know they go to Ben. Um, production companies, uh, again, they, they go to Ben. In fact, this, this past week, uh, we've had another inquiry. Uh, in this case, it's from the production company for Ben Fogel's programs for the BBC, uh, who want to join up with us while we're on Jura this time. Um, and that, that for, for the rest of us, that's terrific because we know somebody professional is talking professional to professional, uh, keeping away stuff we don't want and encouraging stuff we do. Um, thank you very much, Ben. Finally, if I could just uh, put my other hat on, uh, my events hat. Um, the, this year seems to be a bumper year for new books on Orwell. And um, we do everything we can as a society to help members publicize and promote their new books. Already this year, we've um, each month when COVID came and we couldn't have attended events. Uh, I go to this thing I call George Talks, which every month apart from August, somebody gives a half hour, 40 minute talk, question time on Zoom. Um, and that's a great uh, opportunity for people to promote their books. And uh, we've had Peter Stancy uh, get, promote his new, new book, uh, DJ Taylor's new, The New Life. Uh, is, the, is the May George talk. Um, Masha will be giving a George talk in July. Uh, and in um, September, Anna Funder um, will be talking about her new book called Wifedom, that's focused very much on uh, Eileen and the, the two Georges his father and my father, <laughs> um, which uh, is a, uh, going to be a, a different perspective on, on Eileen to Sylvia's excellent book. And last but no, least, no means least, our member Roger Lewis has traveled to all the spots around the world associated with Orwell and in December, um, he will be giving us a talk about that book. Our uh, last year was um, a, a real catch-up year because we had events like the Eileen event in, in March and uh, the visit to Jura in March where people had originally signed up in 2020 and clearly the plague intervened. Um, so last year we did Jura and Spain. We're recreating the alternate year pattern, only it's going to change so that uh, uh, Jura becomes the odd number year and Spain becomes the even number year. Uh, in, in March, we had 
our first visit, which was very successful, to Eton. Uh, and we are signed up to return in a year's time for those who missed out this time. Um, and the big new one, of course, is the product of our member Kevin Carter's amazing research on Orwell and Eileen's time, uh, the six months they spent from September uh, 38 in Marrakesh and thereabouts. He had identified 21 different locations around the town and in the mountains that in this last November, uh, he and his wife and uh, Rick and Ellie and Liz and I went out to Recce. 20 of those places, we were still able to see the actual building. One of those, we fear it might be demolished by the time we go back, but we don't know. The only place that we couldn't physically see because it was demolished in 2005 was the um, bungalow house that they rented. However, by a bit of uh, geography and, and manipulation, distances that we got from the river and from the town, we reckon we got within 100 yards of it, so it's pretty close. <laughs> um, so that's a, 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 a summary of, of um, where we are and what we're going to do about where we want to go. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd like to, can I just yeah. say a few words, if I may? Mm -hmm. I, as, as a patron of the society, I would, of course, like to thank all the trustees for everything they've done. People like Neil and Anne, uh, who are now stepping down. But above all, I think we must thank this gentleman here, Quentin Cobb, for the amount of work. The, the amount of work we have put in to fulfill all those places that we have been to. And there's one other person that needs to be thanked, and she's sitting at the back, Liz. Yes. <laughs> Liz, <laughs> Liz, <laughs> Liz, 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 my mother was, was the power behind the throne. <laughs> and I think it's beholden upon us to say, thank you, Liz. You have done a wonderful job looking after this guy. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed for what you've done, and you've done a superb job. It's going to be a bloody hard uh, <laughs> position to fill, but I hope that it will take, take a long time, time hopefully. Sorry? I <laughs> hope it takes a long time. Well, I think it takes a long time, but nevertheless, <laughs> time will come. <laughs> we are looking towards you and the members to step forward and hopefully perhaps take on the, the mantle that uh, Quentin will inevitably leave behind. Indeed I will, but uh, I've got my lot lined up to take on the, the, patronage, the patronage of, of the society. Yeah. And the uh, foundation uh, when the time comes. So anyway, to all of you, thank you for turning up this afternoon. Thank you to the, uh, the, the trustees. And let us continue with the afternoon. Right. Well, before we uh, do the routine of the minutes and, and hear Ziggurat and um, make a couple of awards, mm -hmm. I'd like to personally thank Neil and Anne. Um, thank you very much. Everybody received either by email or picked up just now uh, the minutes from last year. Uh, can I have a, a proposal, a second of the acceptance of those minutes? Please. Thank you. Thank you. Figures. Okay. Floor's yours. Thank you. Well, was mine. That's the best. Uh, 
Come on, Dave. Which is your best side? Right. Sorry. Can I sit here? Yeah, yeah, we'll stand up because I'll okay, stand up. Fine, okay. Um, well, as um, as in past years, the full our full report on the calendar to go to the charity commissioners uh, are available on the website. And what you've had um, this afternoon is 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 a a summary of them, which I'll um, I'll, I'll I'll go through quickly. Uh, starting with the uh, income and expenditure account, our incoming and night gains. Um, the, the most striking thing is how much our income has increased in 2022. Um, in 2021, we had just 12,000, just 12,154 pounds. And uh, last year, we received 20,000 pounds. Now, there are um, two main reasons for that. One, obviously, is that um, what's that? So Monty Python, three reasons, I think. Um, one is, of course, that our membership is growing, so um, we our numbers of subscriptions therefore increase. Um, the second um, was the um, don't you see donations have gone up from 2,443 to 6,185. Um, that's in large part because of our special um, uh, Wesca appeal, um, which raised uh, 3,770 as at the end of last year. And if you take that away from the total, then donations are very much, uh, other donations are very much as, as last year. Um, and the third, uh, the, the third reason for the increase is the um, surplus from the events and we don't aim you know we aim to make a very small profit on events so that um we can feed that back in um but for largely because um last year events that took place have been uh in planned uh before covid and so costs were uh, estimated then and so on anyway we we ended up with a rather a large surplus from events, and we did refund uh, those members who paid the deposit to go to Jura and were unable to do so at the last at the last minute. But even after that, uh, we had the surplus of two and a half thousand pounds. As I say, we we aim to have a very small, uh, very it's small. A, it's a very fine line. It is. I can't estimate all costs accurately, and I do my best not to have to ask people for more money. Once we're on the road, is it? Right? Yes, so it's best to. Yeah. Okay, well, that's um, that. That's the income side, the expenditure side. Um, journal costs, uh, you'll see, have gone down. That's because last year we published only one, uh, one journal instead of two. Um, this year we're back to we're back to two, and. Um, we have actually budgeted um, ten thousand pounds on journal costs. Uh, we'll need to print more copies now that we have. You know, we, our membership is increasing, mm. and also of course print costs, paper costs, everything else have um, have gone up. So we expect something near ten thousand pounds to to be something on the journal. Um, otherwise, um, costs are fairly uh, self-explanatory. Um, I've I've broken down the at the very bottom of the ex income and expenditure account. There's other the category other, which this year stands at one thousand four hundred and twenty, and I've broken down what that's made up of. Every accountant needs an other, <laughs> <laughs> or some degree. Some of yeah. that sometimes call it some degree. Yeah. Um, I believe it's what the Australians call extras of crickets, and it's some degree. Yeah. Anyway, um, the net result of all that was that instead of um, the, the small deficit that we budgeted for, we in fact made a surplus of five and a half thousand, five and a half thousand pounds. Um, if we then go on to, um, if you have any questions, please ask me when I when I when I finish. Um, the balance sheet is just uh, a snapshot of where we were at the thirty first of December. Uh, we had 33,000, 33 and a half thousand uh, pounds um, 
in the banks that you know, our current account is with Matt West and we have a, a savings account with, with Nationwide and uh, we have a, a PayPal account, uh, which is used by mostly by people who are paying their subscriptions from abroad. And the, the three of those, the three balances together came to £33,500. Um, deposits held on trips is the deposits that we take from members uh, going on, on events, and then we then have to post, um, pay them out on the, if, if before or during. Have you got that um, you'll, you'll, have, you'll have it. You'll have it before during. Um, so that's that. Um, amounts falling due after more than one year under other liabilities. That is membership, uh, life membership subscriptions, which we receive and in um, good accounting practices only to not to recognize the income immediately we receive it, but to, I mean, well, we do a broad, broad brush actuarial calculation and um, release uh, just the, uh, the appropriate fraction each year. So that's, that's the total there that we've, we've received and will be releasing in due course. Um, so there we are, the funds are 176,784. Um, large part of that, of course, is the, is, is, is the oil statue and the um, collections at Wigan. Um, but as, um, and I uh, mentioned that the Westcott Guild was 3,770. That's got to be regarded as obviously restricted for that purpose. So it's not ours to um, spend generally. Um, but after all that, we have um, uh, 20,500, we had, as of 31st December, 20,514 pounds of um, cash, cash, um, cash funds. Uh, so there we are. Um, it's a good, it's a, it's a good position to be in. We do still aim to reduce our reserves or reduce our um, cash funds um, so that we uh, satisfy the <clears throat> charities commission rules. Okay. So that that uh, three thousand dollars that that uh, has said is in 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 the coppers for the monument to Orwell in Huesca that uh, Victor is working hard to create um, is. Comes with a promise from Rick, pound for pound, you put a pound in, he'll put a pound in. For all UK taxpayers, there's gift aid on top of that. So as we stand at the moment, uh, Victor has raised uh, a, in round numbers 10,000 euros so far. We've raised 10,000 euros so far, plus more that's come in since Sunday when Victor gave his talk. Uh, the original budget was 25,000 euro. We think uh, the latest information from the artist is that that might have to be about 1,500 more. We are well on the way to achieving that and I'm delighted. And thank you all very much who contributed. So I mean, it's a very simple sum. If you're a UK taxpayer and, and you, you put a fiver in, a fiver becomes 10, with thanks to Richard, uh, becomes uh, £12.50, thanks to the Chancellor. We don't often say that, do we? <laughs> um, so it's it's quite a it's quite a powerful offer that uh, that we've been able, thanks to Richard, to offer towards the creation of this award, this uh, monument. Just to add that, of course, uh, gift aid doesn't work automatically. You have to make a declaration that you're. Uh, donation is is under gift aid, and they have to then report your the amount you've paid in on in your tax return. Yeah. Thank you very much again. Anybody got any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, as We've said we have a number of awards this year. The journalism awards are on a slightly different timetable, so we're not presenting those today. But today we're very pleased to be presenting the award for uh, dystopian writing to Mishka Burroughs. 
Uh, and I'm doubly delighted about this because Mishka's told me that one of his uh, former teachers before he went to university uh, was our, our member, Alison Doran. So I know Alison's online. I am. <laughs> Mishka, would you like to come? I present you with that. <laughs> Congratulations. This is an amazing moment, honestly. We want to back next year. Well, we go there quite, quite often because I, I work with Bango by Composites. <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's a box in a bag for it somewhere. Yeah. Uh, I'm getting in the screen. There you go. Very important. Very important. Very important. Very important. Very important. Very important. Would you like to announce the winner? So we just have to do the formal process of election of trustees. Ah, well, that's good. Yeah, yeah we do the best of trustees. Yeah. Just, I'm getting ahead of myself, so I'm trying to keep things on schedule for, for right. Tina to be talking it to as well. Yeah. So if, if uh, I can just confirm that we've had uh, seven nominations for trustees for all the coming year, how that is from now. Those nominations are Walter Blair, this is Benjamin, and Cop, Chair, Les Hurst, Masha Karp, Ben Cooper, Sigurds, Kronbergs, and myself. And all seven of those people have been properly uh, proposed and have accepted the role. So that's the position yeah. that it's for the members to. Are you, are you happy for us to continue in your behalf? Yeah. 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 We, we, we do the. Uh, so your your pro who's our prize winner? Well, um, we're going to read out the questions yeah. and then we'll give you the answers when well, well announced. But uh, congratulations to everyone who participated. Matthew will read the questions. I'll read the answers. So, question number one. Who began in 57 High Street, Lower Winfield, but ended at 191 Elsmere Road, West Fletchley? George Bowling in Coming Up What was the title of Orwell's first novel? Burmese Days. From 1942 onwards, Orwell wrote for which Sunday newspaper? The Observer. Uh, the Orwells lived in which London Square in 1945? Canonbury Square. Who did Orwell call one of those writers who are well worth stealing? Charles Dickens. And Orwell thought that beer tasted best in a Chinaman, but he preferred to drink his stout in what? A pewter pot. A statue of Orwell stands outside the offices of which organization? The BBC. The BBC. <laughs> Old Major taught the animals of Manor Farm which song? The Beast of England. In homage to Catalonia, Orwell does not name Harry Milton, calling him what instead? The American. In 1940, Orwell praised which film by Charlie Chaplin repeatedly? The Great Dictator. <laughs> Orwell's mother had two first names. Which of them appears in the lyrics to Badge by Cream? Should we all sing? That's the one I fail miserably with that. Yeah. Talking about our kid, now she's married to Mabel. <laughs> 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 on which island is Barnhill, the Scottish home? Jura. 
A bathroom with a slit's leg ulster, in which other novel are bad legs treated? Clergyman's daughter. <laughs> In 1936, Orwell moved which village where Eileen joined him? Wellington. Who was Orwell's partner editing the Searchlight books? Costco Fiverr. Mm -hmm. Orwell's sister Avril ran the Copper Kettle tea shop in which town? South Wallwood. Who was the subject of Orwell's 1944 essay, Benefit of Clergy? Salvador Dali. Which friend published The Crystal Spirit, a study of George Orwell in 1966? George Woodcock. In which city did Ireland die in 1945? Newcastle, time. In Keep the Estate Supply, what was the name of Gordon Popstock's sister? Congratulations to Hastan, who's the only person who got this right. <laughs> <laughs> Julia. No, 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 no. Julian. <laughs> Three papers tied the second place. Uh, one of those was O'Brien, Jason, um, and somewhere there's another one with 10. Um, oh, sorry, we got one. But anyway, sorry. Um, and then we've got a 12, John Bowen. But our winner with 14 is Steve Folger. Oh, well done, Steve. Your prize is credit to the value of fifteen pounds at Starving Books and free postage. You can't get there to actually come in person. I would recommend. I would recommend the trip to Derbyshire. It is the most wonderful bookshop. I'll give you the details later. So, uh, has anybody got any questions before I ask Robert to give us a quick talk about our visit to Eton? He is in Japan, in Tokyo. At the moment. Yeah. Right. Robert, over to you. Tom. Hello, I'm just uh, sharing my screen with you. Yes, that, uh, thank you very much, Quentin. So we had a wonderful trip to Eton. I felt very, very, very lucky to be have been um, with got through the lottery and um, had a place. It really was a very memorable trip. Um, so as we can see here, Orwell was at Eton between uh, 1917 and 1921. So as we visited this year in March, um, it was just over 100 years since he graduated. Uh, he later said, I have been lucky enough to win a scholarship, but I did no work there. And learned very little, and I don't feel that Eton has been much of a formative experience influence on my life. Uh, I think his success in getting the scholarship was down to hard work rather than luck. He entered it as a King's Scholar, which was the elite within the elite, allowing him to live in the ancient college buildings. So it may not be true that it was luck that got him his scholarship, but there probably was some truth in his statement that he did no work there, at least not the kind of work the school expected of him. Uh, it's a bit difficult to understand, but this is a pretty dire report about him, I think. Of the 70 King Scholars who entered Eton in 1917, only one did worse in his final year than Norwell. Um, we were privileged to visit the college library, which all are very likely never entered, as the boys <laughs> used a bigger and more modern library across the road. Uh, this is a photo of when it had its uh, Orwell 101 exhibition there in 2018. On either side of the doorway, you can see busts of Harold Macmillan and Alec Douglas Hume, uh, two of the many reminders around the school of just how many famous people went there. We were also shown uh, their collection of very fine first editions of Orwell's works. They're certainly proud of having had him as a student, even if he wasn't terribly proud of having been there. This is the uh, large quadrangle with a statue of Henry VI, Eaton's founder. Here we received our 
introduction to the school, it sounded like life there was very demanding with very long, very full days for the boys, lots of homework, lots of classes, lots of odds and ends. We were told about the amazing facilities and opportunities for the boys, 20, 29 science laboratories, 10 languages taught, that kind of thing. You think, wouldn't it be great if all children had these opportunities? But uh, Orwell's riposte to this was, as to the statement that everyone ought to go to Eton or Harrow, it is meaningless. The whole value of these places from the point of view of the people who go there is their exclusiveness. But he could be nice about school. He wrote, it has magnificent buildings and playing fields, beautiful surroundings. It also has one great virtue, a tolerant and civilized atmosphere, which gives every boy a fair chance of developing his own individuality. Some of its traditions deserve to be remembered. Uh, and I can't help but think that there's a lot about Orwell that actually uh, shows the very best of Eton that he was encouraged to think for himself. We were allowed into the chapel, uh, which visitors aren't usually allowed because it has some fantastically precious wall paintings in it. Uh, you can see them on either side, on either side of the aisle. Um, every boy has, still has to attend a religious service there every morning, regardless of his religion, which I was surprised by. Uh, as for Orwell, in the chapel at Eton in November 1918, which was the month the First World War ended, uh, he was confirmed by Charles Gore, the Bishop of Oxford. However, by this time, according to his friend Cyril Colony, he had renounced not just God, but Empire Kipling, Sussex and character. <laughs> Very harsh on Sussex, I think. <laughs> Orwell didn't reject all of the Eastern things. He participated in the wall game. I think our, our guide, I can't quite remember what our guide said about that, but I think it was something like he was the last boy to score a goal in it. It's tremendously difficult to score a goal, something like that. Anyway, he included a satisfyingly snide remark about what the boys gained from sport at the school in the Lion and the Unicorn. Probably the Battle of Waterloo was won on the playing fields of Eton, but the opening battles of all subsequent wars have been lost there. <laughs> For me, the most moving thing at the school was the endless rows of names of old Etonians who had died in the wars. Uh, inevitable, of course but uh, the long boards bring it home. Orwell wrote of the peace celebrations in 1919. Our elders decided for us that we should celebrate peace in the traditional manner by whooping over the fallen foe. We were to march into the schoolyard carrying torches and sing jingo songs of the type of rule Britannia. The boys to their honor, I think, guide the whole proceeding and sang blasphemous and seditious words to the tunes provided. It would have been nice if he could have told us what they were, but uh, I think that would have made the book entirely unprintable in the 1930s. Another striking thing was that even today, there are distinctions between the students in the same year. So there were some milling around during the tour and the guide could tell us what their position was from differences in their uniforms. Uh, at the same time, he was stressing how inclusive, diverse, and modern the school was. Uh, I felt the message of the uniforms was how traditional and status conscious it was. Uh, I think it's probably all of these things. Um, here's a photo of Orwell in a group of Eton boys. Um, he's this boy here. If I hope you can see my cursor. I'm sure many of you know this photo. Um, I, I would say he's looking questioning, but at the same time fit, fitting in uh, and his hair is an awful lot neater than it was in later photos. Um, he wrote later, I suppose 
there is no place in the world where snobbery is quite so ever present or where it is cultivated in such refined and subtle forms as in an English public school. Here, at least one cannot say that English education fails to do its job. You forget your Latin and Greek within a few months of leaving the school. Your snobbishness, unless you persistently root it out like a bindweed it is, sticks by you till you grave. Uh, sorry, I'll just, um, yes, here it is. Um, so he continued on the theme of how Eton stuck to you like superglue with Comrade X is an old Etonian. He would be ready to die on the barricade, in theory anyway, but you notice that he still leaves his bottom waistcoat button undone. <laughs> he idealizes the proletariat, but it is remarkable how little his habits resemble theirs. Um, I suspect that he was largely describing himself. I'll close with this thought, which I don't think is true of Orwell, but is of others. Were I to deduce anything from my feelings on leaving Eton, it might be called the theory of permanent adolescence. It is the theory that the experiences undergone by boys at the great public schools are so intense as to dominate their lives and to arrest their development. <laughs> I thank you. I thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Yeah, there's, 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 can we ask a question? There's a question. Oh, yes. Of course, I hope I can answer. I'm sure. Um, did you ask how much they charge annually? Yes, it was how much? Yes. It was 27, wasn't it, Robert? I think it was 48. Okay. I think it was 48,000. Okay. Uh, but but they do not make a profit. They, no, 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 they make a loss. On the basis of all Actually, the various investments and endowments. That's right. So the, the education actually costs a lot more than 48,000. Um, so, so the parents are getting a bargain. <laughs> Could I, I make a small comment? I think Orwell was very ambivalent about Eton. On the yeah. one hand, he didn't write a major essay like uh, on St. Cyprian, so the focus hasn't been on it. But it was absolutely crucial. The old Etonian connections throughout his writing career, uh, and one can list a whole number of names, David Astor, Richard Reed, Cyril Connolly, et cetera, et cetera, who were absolutely crucial. And very subtly, he never really highlighted this connection in, in any of his writings. No, I mean, the, remark, the remark that Robert uh, quoted, you know, about Eaton having no impact on him, that was exactly my first thought, Richard, that, yeah. that, that, that given all those people, Exactly. Uh, the, the society had an impact on him, if not the official school. Yeah. And I, I think it actually probably, as I say, I think it probably had a very good impact on him in many ways. Yeah, well, the, the, those, those um, yeah. Uh, encouragement to challenge ideas that he exemplifies is yeah. still encouraged to this day. He was going to send Richard to Eton, but when he found that they wore a silly, silly uniform, they cha he changed his mind, didn't he, Richard? He did. He did. Yeah. then put me down for Westminster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Another silly <thing. laughs> uh, uniform. That was. Can we please thank Robert? That was. Thank you very much. But Robert is down nearly the middle of the night because he's in Tokyo. So we have his answer about the visit on the website. Good, yes.